Good morning, afternoon and evening. I'm Wim van der Velde from the Global Network of People Living with HIV, and I'm joined by my co-chair, Lindsay McKenna from Treatment Action Group. On behalf of myself and Lindsay and our distinguished panel, I'd like to welcome you and to thank you for joining us for this Community Connect session, Research and Sharing with Communities, Part 2, Shorter Regimens for Drug-Resistant TB. Four Phase 3 trials evaluating whether treatment regimens for drug-resistant TB could be shortened to six or nine months were completed recently. Stream 2, TB Practical, BTB conducted in India, and beach tuberculosis conducted in South Africa. During this session, researchers from these four studies will share their findings and then respond to questions. We'll start with presentations from Andrew Nunn from the UK Medical Research Council, Catherine Berry from MSF, Padma Chandra Sekaran from the Indian Council of Medical Research, and Francesca Conradi from the University of Witwatersrand. And then hear from our community respondents, Global TB Cap members, Oksana Ruxineo and Annie Hernasari before opening up for the question and answer to the wider audience. We hope you will enjoy the presentations and look forward to seeing you after the presentations for the live Q&A and discussions. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you're coming to us from. Um, my name is Dr. Catherine Berry and I'm the Global Principal Investigator for TV Practical. And on behalf of the investigators, partners and collaborators, I'm very happy to share with you a little bit more on the final trial results of our clinical trial. So what was, clinic, what was TB Practical? Um, well, it was a clinical trial that was investigating regimens uh, in uh, drug-resistant TB. What did we test? Uh, how does it work? What are the side effects? What's the quality of life of the people with TB who took the regimens we tested? Is it going to cost a lot more? And is this anything that's stopping us getting started with these regimens now we have these results? These are just a few things we'd like to explore today. So what was TB Practical? TB Practical tested three investigational regimens uh, that were all based on the BPAL regimen. Uh, so that's including bedaquiline, protominid, and linezolid at a dose of 600 uh, for 16 weeks, followed by 300 milligrams for eight weeks. Two of the regimens also included uh, moxifloxacin in arm one and clofazamine in arm two. This was compared to the World Health Organization standard of care that was continuously updated uh, since the trial started back in 2017. And so uh, participants who qualified for a nine month regimen um, that was available to them um, up to 96 weeks, which was the duration of uh, uh, XDR or now known as pre-XDR regimens when the trial started. Uh, so what we started out with was three regimens and up to 240 patients were recruited into the trial. Um, an analysis was done and uh, one of the regimens was taken forward to uh, stage two and continued to recruit into the standard of care. Um, the arm that looked the most promising at that analysis was the big power arm. Following that, we continued to recruit and after 552 people with TB were enrolled in the trial, which was about 75 of expected participants, uh, the independent board that was monitoring the trial indicated to us that we should stop the trial for efficacy, which is what we did. Uh, we reported 12 months ago our interim results, and today we're showing, sharing with you the final results. So here's the big question, does it work? So we found it, after our final analysis and everyone was followed up that 88.3% of people with TB who took BPAL-M were cured by six months. The disease didn't relapse and they weren't were alive and contactable by two years or about 100 weeks, eight weeks from study start. People in the BPAL-C and BPAL-Arms were also followed up up to 108 weeks uh, 
for those that were, uh, were recruited earlier on in the study. We've reported those results as well, and they've also performed well, which is reassuring. The standard of care worked in 59.1% of people, mostly due to interruptions um, for more than two weeks in those that weren't able to complete it. And this was usually due to side effects, but sometimes uh, was due to tolerance or other social reasons just due to the length of treatment. So what are the side effects of these new regimens? The types of side effects we saw in the trial were in line with current drug-resistant TB treatments. However, serious and severe side effects were much more frequent in the standard of care reg regimens, and we saw that almost twice as often. So there was around 23% of people with TB in the BPAL-M regimen who experienced a severe or more serious side effect versus 48% in the standard of care. Additionally, of the 552 participants in the trial, 13 died, nine of, of whom were in the standard of care. No one died of TB or a side effect in the TB treatments in any of the BPAL-based regimens. We also did some sub-studies to try and understand a little bit better about the uh, the way that the trial regimens worked in particular for people with TB. One of the sub-studies we reported on today was the patient reported outcome study. For this, we administered two quality of life surveys and uh, for some of the people in the experimental arms also conducted in-depth interviews to try and explain how improvements in quality of life and well-being might be found for trial participants. What we found was all participants' quality of life improved with treatment uh, with, the, in, with the shorter regimens having no negative effect on it, on the improvement scene. Um, in the interviews, it was noted that support from clinician, counsellors and family were unsurprisingly essential throughout treatment, but also importantly in follow-up. Shorter regimens don't negate the need for treatment support. And when we're thinking about implementing these regimens, the focus may also need to be adjusted. We also did an economic evaluation in the trial, and we found that the cost per person of BPAL, BPAL-M um, regimens was much less compared to the standard of care, particularly the 18-month or longer regimens. Uh, Despite the increased cost of uh, some of the components of the BPAL regimens, this was offset by uh, the shortening of the regimen and the associated, uh, associated follow-up needed for patients. So when we're thinking about this regimen, we're already thinking very much about how this might be um, brought to patients. And we've been thinking about that since our interim results 12 months ago. Significant result work has been done to ensure access uh, so far, and this includes um, making Protomnid available via the Global Fund. Um, Protomnid's been registered in a number of countries, and also Beatrice has facilitated a named patient access program. More can be done and MSF has started to roll this out in four countries already using both operational research modalities and programmatic approaches. In 2023, we expect to be supporting at least 12 countries. We note that technical support will be ongoing and we've developed a toolkit to assess with implementation. This can be found at uh, the following web address. So in conclusion, there's now strong evidence of efficacy and safety of BPAL-based regimens supporting a transition to a six-month regimen. There is a cost saving associated with these regimens, as well as time and inconvenience reduced compared to the long regimens. But we do need to keep in mind people with TB will continue to need support from clinicians, counsellors and family 
And we might need to think that compared to the 18 month freshmen, some of this focus might be needed to adjust, be adjusted somewhere. I just wanted to take this opportunity to acknowledge a very significant number of collaborators which made this clinical trial possible. And in particular, um, I wanted to acknowledge the uh, really essential role of the, of the participants, um, the people with TB who were brave and put their selves forward um, at, at some risk to themselves uh, to, to help answer these important questions and um, we think um, make an important advance and difference to um, people diagnosed with, uh, with uh, rifampicin resistant TB going forward. Thank you very much for the invitation and I look forward to further discussion. Good morning. Uh, I present before you our work to evaluate the efficacy and safety of a combination regimen of bedaquiline, delaminate, lenazolid, and clothazamin in adults with pre XDR pulmonary tuberculosis, the BTB India study. Our work was recently published in the Clinical Infectious Diseases Journal. With the availability of newer drugs, bedaquiline, delaminate in India, there was a greater scope for us to develop a patient-friendly treatment regimen for better treatment outcome in drug-resistant TB patients with additional resistance to fluoroquinolone or second-line injectables. This study was conducted before WHO changed the definition of pre-XDR and XDR. So for this study, we have taken pre-XDR patients are those who are MDR-TB with additional resistance to fluoroquinolone or second-line injectables. And XDR-TB patients are those who have resistance to fluoroquinolone and second line injectable along with multidrug resistant TB. So we wanted to evaluate the effectiveness and safety when bedaquiline was combined with delaminate along with lenazolid and clofazimin and given for 24 weeks in pre-XDR and XDR TB patients. Bedaquiline was given as 400 milligram for the first two weeks followed by 200 milligram on alternate days for the remaining 22 weeks. Delaminate was given as 100 milligram twice daily. Lenazolid as 600 milligram once daily and clofazimin was given as either 100 or 200 milligram based on the body weight of the individual. It was a prospective cohort of 167 adults with pre-XDR pulmonary TB or XDR TB conducted at five sites in the country, two sites in New Delhi, one each in Mumbai, Ahmedabad and Chennai. All the participants went through a detailed pre-treatment screening which included sputum examination, liver and renal function test, cardiac evaluation, uh, as well as the domestic stability. And if found eligible, all of them went through uh, a written informed consent process and were started on bedaquiline, delaminate, lenazolid, and clofazimin combination. The treatment was daily and was supervised either by the drug treatment provider or by the household uh, contact for a period of 24 weeks. At the end of treatment, at the end of 24 weeks, the sputum culture of 16th week was looked at. If the 16th week sputum culture was negative, the treatment was stopped at 24th week. If the 16th week sputum culture was positive, treatment was continued till 36 weeks. We were looking for a favorable response at the end of treatment, which was defined as negative sputum cultures with resolution of clinical signs and symptoms and radiological improvement, or unfavorable response, which was defined as either backlogical failure or clinical failure or during the treatment period or recurrence of the disease during 12 month post treatment follow up. We screened 287 participants for the study. There were 122 treatment uh, screening failures, which included mainly smear negative individuals at the start of treatment. There were also quite a number of patients who were not willing to take the shorter regimen as they were afraid of the combination of drugs and the toxicity uh, involved with it, and they prefer to take a longer regimen with injectable. We enrolled 165 participants in the trial. The age varied between 18 to 56 years. Though the protocol was open to enroll participants up to 65 years of age, 
the site principal investigator uh, were little apprehensive about enrolling elderly individuals and hence they restricted their intake up to 50 55 years the median body weight was for 46 kgs and 60% of the population had a bmi of less than 18.5 96% of the population was fluoroquinolone resistant bilateral disease for chest x ray was found in 60% of the individuals and as you can see, majority of individuals in the trial had more than two plus uh, acid pass bacilli in the uh, sputum smears. After starting treatment, the patient was followed every month. Uh, and during the monthly visits, the, the symptom resolutions as well as the sputum testing was done to see the resolution of acid pass bacilli in the sputum. We found there was an average weight gain of at least one kg every month during the treatment period. There were 165 patients enrolled overall. 158 of them were fluoroquinolone resistant. Seven of them were fluoroquinolone sensitive but second line injectable resistance. During the treatment phase, 12 patients had to be removed from the trial because either they were all drug sensitive to the culture or they were uh, uh, smears negative during the follow up period. Of the 165 patients, we have 153 patients whose uh, results were analyzed. Of them, 139 turned out to be negative at the end of six months of treatment, amounting to 91% of cure rate at the end of 24 weeks of treatment. We had 14 patients who developed unfavorable uh, outcome. Average time for smear conversion was 9.5 weeks, and culture conversion happened around 8.5 weeks. Of the patients who had unfavorable outcome, the 14 of whom, one patient had to be withdrawn because of pregnancy at week 10, of the remaining 13 patients, uh, the table here shows the breakup. Uh, majority of them, six of the patients had to have a treatment change because of adverse event. Two of them had abnormal liver function tests during the follow-up period. Two developed prolonged QTC interval. There was one each of thrombocytopenia and optic neuritis. Two patients developed pathological failure during the treatment phase. There were four deaths, mainly uh, three because of breathlessness and one because of hemoptysis. The two patients who had bacteriological failure during treatment period had all the drug sensitive to begin with. Uh, 60 years, one was 60 years old, uh, sorry, 40 years old, other one was 28 years old, and they had extensive disease as shown with the x ray with bilateral involvement of the lung. At the time of culture reversion, we found uh, the patient were positive uh, on culture, but the resistance pattern showed resistance to bedaculin in those two patients who were sensitive to BDQ at, at the beginning of the treatment period. We did encounter adverse events, but our adverse events were more in terms of skin hyperpigmentations. 59% of the population in this group had hyperpigmentation during the treatment period. The next most common adverse event was hepatobiliary abnormality. The liver enzymes were elevated during the treatment phase, followed by anemia and thrombocytopenia, and then it was peripheral neuropathy in this cohort. We did encounter QTC prolongation in two patients. Rest of them all were within the given uh, uh, upper limit of 470 milliseconds. As you can see in this graph, none of our patients had more than 500 milliseconds of QTC prolongation in the treatment phase. We had 33 serious adverse events in this cohort. Majority of them was because of breathlessness at the time of uh, uh, during the treatment period. We had four deaths, two because of breathlessness, one because of massive hemoptysis, and one patient developed septic shock during the follow-up period. Uh, secondary urinary tract infection. Rest of all the adverse events, which varied from fever, gastritis, pneumothorax, acute exacerbation of asthma, anemia, peripheral neuropathy, and also pancreatic enzyme elevation, all resolved during the treatment phase. The severity of these uh, uh, adverse events varied from grade 1 to grade 3, and they appeared sometime between 8th week of treatment to 24th week of treatment period. So in this combination of bedactrin with the laminin along with linazolin and profasamine had a favorable outcome of 91% in MDRTB patient with uh, FQ resistance or second line injectable resistance. We had a 69% favorable outcome when MDRTB was associated with both fluoroquinolone and second line injectable resistance. The median time to culture conversion at 8 weeks. Cardiotoxicity in this cohort was minimal. Three potentially QTC prolonged drugs were used in this regimen and hence the ECG was monitored very frequently. The myosuppression that we saw in this cohort was manageable even in the field conditions. At the end of treatment, the patients were followed up for a period of 12 months post-treatment. 139 patients had a favorable outcome at week 48. 
94% had a sustained treatment success, 2% had recurrence of TB, TB lost a follow-up and one died during week 28 because of respiratory distress. All the adverse events showed resolution, including fading away of hyperpigmentation was seen in 84% of this cohort. Peripheral neuropathy was reversed in 75% of patients and all the drug-induced anemia resolved during the follow-up phase. To conclude, this fully oral, non-injectable, non-fluoropinolone-containing regimen has shown promising results in MDR-TB patients with additional resistance to fluoropinolone. Hence, this can be considered uh, in, in patients who have MDR-TB uh, under resistant to fluoropinolone. But, but we are also advised to consider this regimen in earlier stage of the disease, even in countries who have access to BPAL regimen. This cohort included diabetic patients and adolescent group of patients. And this can also be tried in children because individual drugs, vedaclin, and delaminate and lenazolid have been used in children for many years. We also found that the adverse event encountered because of this regimen is easily identifiable in field condition and can also be fully corrected. One research gap that we identified during the conduct of the study was um, we did not have a head-to-head -head comparison of bedaculin, delaminate, lenazolid versus bedaculin, picomidate, and lenazolid, the BPAL regimen. We would also like to see the response to different lineages of mycobacterium by using these two regimens. One difficulty that we encountered was the dosing of delaminate. Currently, delaminate is being given as twice daily dose, whereas the other drugs in this regimen is given once daily. And also, the dosing is two drugs, whereas the other drugs are all a single pill. Hence, the dosing of the laminate would be very helpful if it can be brought down either as 200 milligram single pill. Um, uh, so, to end, I would like to thank the entire bead study team of all the five sites National Institute for Research in Tuberculosis, Chennai, National Institute for TB and Respiratory Diseases, New Delhi, Rajan Babu Institute of Pulmonary Medicine and Tuberculosis, New Delhi, BJ Medical College, Ahmedabad, and Government Hospital of Thoracic Medicine at Tamaram. And also sponsors the USA team, both at India and in the US teams, are studying monitor CDSA and the Central DB Division of New Delhi. Thank you. Stream stage two, evaluating a nine month bedaculin containing regimen for MDR TB. My name is Andrew Nunn and I work at the Medical Research Council Clinical Trials Unit at University College London. I have no conflict of interest. In stream stage one, we compared the WHO recommended regimen for MDR TB with a nine month regimen closely similar to the one that's been developed in Bangladesh. And we demonstrated that the nine month regimen was non inferior to the 20 month WHO regimen. In stage two, we're assessing a fully oral bedaquiline containing regimen given for nine months and a six month regimen containing both bedaquiline and an injectable given for a shorter duration. There were four regimens to which patients could be allocated. The WHO 20 month control as given locally, the control regimen of the nine months, which consisted of moxifloxacin, clofazamine, ethambutol and pyrazinamide, supplemented by canamycin, isoniazid, and prozionamide in the intensive phase. An oral nine-month regimen in which levofloxacin replaced moxifloxacin, and canamycin was replaced by vidaculin, which was given throughout treatment. And then a six-month regimen in which ethambutol and prozionamide were both dropped, but canamycin and vidaculin were both given but the, in the intensive phase was reduced from 16 weeks to eight weeks. So the design of the study was open label, multi-country, non-inferior randomized trial. Due to slow initial in recruitment and changes in practice, we stopped randomizing to the WHO 2011 regimen early and subsequently also to the six month regimen in most countries. So the oral versus control comparison became our primary comparison. 76 week efficacy assumptions were that the control regimen would be 80% successful compared to 82% on the oral pedacquin containing regimen with a 10% margin of non-inferiority and 80% power. A minimum of 200 participants per arm were required to be randomized, assuming that 14% were unaccessible 
in the per protocol analysis. Key eligibility criteria were that patients should be adults infected with MTB, which was resistant to rifampicin, but sensitive on a line probe assay to fluoroquinolones and aminoglycosides. Patients with a QTC greater than 450 milliseconds or evidence of liver, liver abnormality were excluded as were pregnant or breastfeeding women. Participants were assessed 76 weeks after involved, enrollment. A favorable outcome was that the last two cultures should be negative, the latest of those in the 76 week window, provided that an unfavorable outcome had not already been obtained. An unfavorable outcome was a composite measure based on bacteriological or non-bacteriological reasons like change of treatment for adverse event or death from any cause. Enrollment began in March 2016 and continued through to January 2020. A total of 588 patients were enrolled from countries in Africa, Asia and Eastern Europe. Participants were followed up weekly to week four, four weekly to week 52, eight weekly to week 84, and 12 weekly thereafter. A clinical review together with microbiological and safety assessments were performed at each visit. Enrollment was stopped in South Africa in August 2018 because an all oral podaquiline containing regimen had been introduced by the national program. The baseline characteristics are shown on this slide in the MITT population, that is those who were, who were eligible for the study. Almost two thirds of patients were male and over 50% were in fact in the 25 to 44 year age group. About 13% of patients were HIV infected and looking at the radiographic extent of disease of cavitation and the smear status, you can see that the majority of patients had fairly extensive disease. The primary outcome analysis is shown on this slide. 71.1% on the control regimen had a favorable outcome compared to 82.7% on the oral regimen. That was statistically highly significant result. Amongst those who were unfavorable, 10.7% of them were for bacteriological reasons and 4.1% on the oral regimen. For non-bacteriological reasons, it was 18.2% on the control and 13.3% on the oral regimen. Looking in a little bit more detail at the bacteriological reasons for an unfavorable outcome, the commonest reason was reversion bacteriological reversion during treatment, 11 on the control compared to three on the oral, and change of treatment due to persistent positive culture, which was five patients on the control regimen, but none on the oral. So moving on to the non-bacteriological reasons for an out favorable outcome. The commonest reason was treatment changed after an adverse event, and this occurred in 20 patients in the control compared to just six on the oral regimen. And among those 20, 13 of them started the Nesled, and of the six, all of them were given an injectable. So turning on to the safety events, and this analysis is based on all the patients who are randomized, 202 control, 211 on oral. Similar proportions of patients had serious adverse events and also grade three or four adverse events, which were very common, 53% and 50% respectively. Treatment change due to an adverse event was more, occurred more frequently on the control regimen, 30% compared to 18%. There are a small number of deaths, five on the control and seven on the oral regimen, and there was no clear pattern of death. These were for a variety of reasons. So looking at the reasons for severe adverse events, the commonest of these was QT prolongation, 23% and 24% respectively. Similar proportions for hepatic disorders, 14 and 15%, and for metabolism and nutrition disorders, 10% and 
What is striking here is the reduction in hearing and vestibular disorders, which dropped from 10% on the control to just 3% on the oral regimen. Here we're looking at some selected events. First of all, QTC greater than 500 milliseconds. That was 6% on the control compared to 3% on the oral regimen. ALT or AST greater than five times the upper limb at normal, about 10% on both regimens. But then looking at the grade three or four hearing loss, 9% control dropping to just 2% on the oral regimen. So to summarize the main findings, the efficacy of the control regimen was clearly superior to that of the control regimen. Bacterological failure or recurrence was less likely to occur in the oral regimen. And safety profiles of the regimen were generally very similar, with a small number of deaths with no clear pattern by regimen. Grade three or four adverse events were common in both regimens, but encouragingly, the severe hearing loss was dramatically reduced in the oral regimen. QTCF prolongation of greater than 500 milliseconds was observed only in a small proportion of patients. And finally, just a brief look at the com a comparison of the six month and oral regimens. It's interesting to note that on the six month regimen, 91% of patients had a favorable outcome compared to just 78.6% on the oral regimen, a striking significant difference. Grade three or four adverse events were slightly more common on the six month regimen, but not significantly so. And indeed, the proportion of patients with severe hearing loss problems was 4% on the six-month regimen compared to 2% on the oral regimen. There were just two patients on each regimen who died. So finally, just to say thank you to the, our funders and indeed a, a very special thank you to all our participants and collaborators without whom this study would certainly not have been possible. Thank you very much for your attention. Today I'm presenting some of the results of the beat tuberculosis study. It is a pragmatic randomized controlled strategy study. We conduct an interim analysis to assist the National TV Program of South Africa as it deliberated on modifying the guidelines for the treatment of rifampicin resistant TB. This study is funded by USAID and is embedded within the South African National TB Program. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. The thinking in this trial was to hit early and hit hard. The study strategy was designed to treat all types of rifampicin resistant TB from rifampicin monoresistant TB all the way to fluoroquinolone resistant TB. We used drugs that were already registered within the program. We included children from the age of six years and upwards. Breastfeeding and pregnant women could be uh, enrolled and it was embedded within the national TB program. What this means is that we conduct the study at sites of the national TB program we used the drug and laboratory services associated with the National TB program. B tuberculosis study is an ongoing open label randomized control study to establish the efficacy and safety of a study strategy versus a control strategy. The study strategy consists of, a, of six months of bedaquiline, delaminid, and linezolid with additional levofloxacin and clofazamine. The study strategy is compared to the current South African standard of care or the control strategy. The control strategy has seven medications, bedaquiline, linezolid for two months, levofloxacin, clofazamine, ethambutol, and high dose INH for the first two, four months of therapy. It is a non-inferiority design with a sample size of 400. I'd like to describe what we called the diagnostic triage and employed on this trial. Most patients entered treatment for rifampicin-resistant TB with a gene expert result. Once they had been consented to being part of the study, they were assessed for eligibility. If they were eligible, they are randomized to one of two strategies. The study strategy consists of bedaquiline, linezolid, and delaminid with additional levofloxacin and clofazamine. At the time of starting treatment, 
A second line line probe assay is done, usually on a culture specimen. If this shows fluoroquinolone sensitivity, the clofazamine is stopped. If it shows fluoroquinolone resistance, the levofloxacin is stopped. If for some reason the line probe assay is unsuccessful, then all five drugs are continued. The control strategy is the South African standard of care. It consists of an all, it is an all oral bedaquiline based regimen with seven drugs in it. If the line probe assay in patients randomized to the control strategy is unsuccessful, the treatment is continued unchanged. If fluoroquinolone resistance is detected, the patients are then given an individualized regimen for 18 months. I'm not going to list all the inclusion exclusion criteria in full. What is unusual about this trial is that individuals from six years and older could be enrolled. Pregnant and breastfeeding women could be enrolled. If a pregnant woman was screened, we conducted an ultrasound done, we conducted an ultrasound sound to establish a viral intrauterine pregnancy. In order to decrease the risk of enrolling someone with bedaquiline resistant TB, participants were excluded if they had more than 28 days of bedaquiline exposure, but less than six months. Complicated extrapulmonary TB was exclusionary, and the usual safety bloods were performed. We began enrollment in the study in August 2019. You can see a slight flattening of the enrollment curve that occurred during the time of the hard lockdown of COVID-19. At two sites in South Africa, we have screened 396 individuals with rifampicin-resistant TB, and we have enrolled 94% of them, or 374. They were randomized at two sites in South Africa. I've noticed since the inclusion of this particular abstract, all 400 patients have been accrued to the study. 191 participants were enrolled to the study strategy and 183 to the control strategy. The median age of people enrolled on B tuberculosis was between 34 and 35 years. Our youngest participant was eight and our oldest was 69. 189 persons with HIV were infected, were included. All patients who were HIV infected were initiated or reinitiated on appropriate antiretroviral therapy, and it almost always contained dolitegravir. We enrolled more male patients than females, and we have uh, 25 patients who are younger than 18. Of note is that 43% of the patients enrolled had a BMI less than 18.5. And this is a marker of poor prognosis in someone who, is, who has TB. Twenty five point seven or twenty seven point nine percent of participants on the study and control strategy respectively experienced grade three to grade five serious adverse events. The most common adverse event experienced by our participants was anemia almost always related to lenezolid. 33 versus 31 participants experienced serious adverse events during the study. Seven participants who were enrolled in the study strategy died either during treatment or in follow-up, and six participants in the control strategy died either on treatment or during follow-up. This gives us an overall mortality rate of 3.5%. As only 37% of the participants had reached the full 76 weeks of follow-up, we used a revised outcome considering the end of follow-up at 52 weeks or later. In this modified interim analysis of 199 participants, 87% of the participants on the study strategy and 86% of the participants on the control strategy had a successful outcome. The conclusion of this study is that a six months all oral bedaquiline delaminid lenezolid containing regimen has comparable efficacy to the current South African standard of care. It is reassuring that these results are similar to the B tuberculosis study conducted in India, where 91% of patients in a pre XDR population were treated with this regimen. This shows a viable alternative to 
BPAL with or without moxifloxacin. And it can certainly start to be used almost immediately in children and in pregnant women. I would like to acknowledge the following people. The first is the B tuberculosis team, an incredibly hardworking team of nurses, doctors, clinicians, and support staff. I'd like to thank our patients and their families who participated to, in this trial. I'd like to thank the National TB Program of South Africa, and in particular, our brave and fearless leader, leader Norbert Njeka. The study was conducted in the Eastern Cape and in KwaZulu-Natal, and I'd like to thank the Departments of Health for their participation. And finally, I'd like to thank USAID for funding our study. Thank you very much. Great, welcome back everyone. And thank you to Andrew, Catherine, uh, Padma and Francesca for the presentations. Also, I'd like to welcome Professor Sarah Meredith, who will be taking questions on behalf of Andrew and the stream team, and also Dr. Pauline Howell, who will be doing the same on behalf of Francesca and the Beat Tuberculosis South Africa team. So if you have questions for the presenters, please enter them using the Q&A function. Um, and if you see a question that you share an interest in, you can please upvote it using the heart icon. Uh, before we take uh, questions from the wider audience, we'll start with comments and questions from the community respondents we have on the panel. So at this time, I'll ask everyone to turn on their videos. Um, and Oksana, we'll start with you. Please um, introduce yourself and go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the great presentation. I'm Oksana Rukshinyanu, based in Moldova, and then I'm a TBCAB member. I'm very happy to be here and listen to this uh, wonderful and great results. But we really missed in uh, this kind of data for uh, address drug resistant TB in worldwide. I would like to uh, address my question to all the presenters, of course, uh, if you want it relevant. If uh, could you please uh, uh, explain us? Uh, how you see that these results, the overall results of these drug-resistant uh, treatment uh, treatment regimens, would actually inform the treatment policy uh, globally and practice. Uh, what do you do? You think these trials will tell us about the future role of these injectables, vice uh, the use of uh, the dacolin, and of course the uh, the delamanine vice pertomanid in the shorter treatment regimens for drug-resistant TB. I would really appreciate your inputs and your ideas about it. Thank you so much. So in, in terms of response, I'll give a order. We'll do Pauline and then uh, Catherine and then Sarah. Um, thank you. So what was really great about the uh, BEAT trial in South Africa is that we were using drugs that have already been registered. As we all know, the predominant pipeline is still some time away for children and for pregnant ladies, and delaminate is immediately usable, which is fantastic. Uh, it's also great to see that the efficacy is roughly translatable to BPAL, which WHO, of course, recommended in May 2022. And so we hope that these results will be able to inform quicker implementation and access, because really, at the end of the day, patients really want shorter treatment that is easier to take. And um, we hope that this really will move us in the right direction. Thanks. Catherine, over to you next. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, I mean, so we actually did an interim analysis 12 months ago and provided this data to the WHO. So. Uh, uh, I think in combination with the Xenix data and Nix data um, it was uh, also overall um, considered and, and uh, recommendation has been made. Um, I think we now have um, much more precision and um, much more confidence in the, uh, in the, in the data and the efficacy and safety data now have much more narrow confidence intervals. And um, really, I think people should be reassured as well as um, a much bigger standard of care representative of the current standard of care used globally. Uh, so I think, uh, yeah, we would um, definitely call on, on, on uh, 
people to actually go ahead already and implement this as a option that doesn't need um, to wait for fluoroquinolone resistance testing and uh, is, is useful for most people with uh, uh, rifampicin resistant TB. Thank you. Uh, and Sarah, over to you. Thanks. Thank you. So it's a, it's a it's an exciting time, isn't it? Um, and I think what I mean what what we're seeing now is options options for programs and 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 patients, which is which is very good news. Um, I mean, what we showed in stream was that we for the first time we now have randomized evidence of the efficacy of a nine month oral regimen, which although everyone thought based on the, the South African experience was likely, we, we now have evidence of that. And we have the potential for six month regimens. Um, and, and, and although uh, BIPA of course uh, is extremely attractive, um, as we've heard, we. It, uh, you know, it's it's not yet available for everyone, and um, and we've we've you know, and there are potentially alternatives. The difficulty in interpreting all this, of course, is we don't have to you know we we don't have direct head to head comparisons of of the of the alternatives, and we're not likely to get them very easily. Uh, what I what the 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 um, the, the point though that. Uh, comes home to me is that um, bedaquiline is absolutely central to all of the options and it is um, essential that we protect bedaquiline uh, and you know and are really careful with it uh, particularly in roll in the rollout uh, because um, uh, we we absolutely must try to prevent as much bedaquiline resistance as possible. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, next, we'll go over to our second community respondent, Ani Hernasari. I'll turn it over to you. Please introduce yourself and go ahead. Yeah. Thank you so much for the great presentation. My name is Ani Hernasari. I'm TB survivor from Indonesia, and I am a TB cap member. Uh, I just want to ask, uh, you know, about the the global population affected by TB is often more diverse in terms of age and then uh, comorbidities, and then the population typically included in the TB clinical trials. Can the presenter comment on the data? available to support the use of this regimen in the special population, for example, in PLHIV, in children, pregnant women, and people who use drug, or maybe people with diabetes, people with viral hepatitis, and the people with the extra pulmonary TB. Thank you. Thanks, Ani. I think we'll switch up the order this time. So let's go Catherine, and then Sarah, and then Pauline. Yeah, thanks. And um, I think it's as we're finding more and more um, having uh, really representative um, uh, cohorts in our clinical trials is, is super important. Um, otherwise, we really find we're left not knowing what to do at the end of trials. Trials are the best way to actually supervise and, and, um, and, and follow um, including vulnerable um, participants as closely as possible um, rather than asking the question later and then excluding them from guidelines. Uh, so in practical, it was always a huge priority for us to include um, people with HIV at all CD4 counts. And um, I, I think we can, uh, we can confidently say this is, this is useful in this population. Um, we had no exclusion criteria for hepatitis. And in fact, we have uh, gone on and treated people with hepatitis C um, in the, within the frame of the trial. Um, we were not able to include children and uh, pregnant women, um, mostly due to the um, unknown uh, ongoing questions around protominid, which I think are soon to be answered, but uh, still taking more time than we would like. 
um, but uh, at this conference we, uh, we, we were able to present the data of um, uh, women who were, uh, were exposed in the, in, the, um, in, the, in the process of the trial. So uh, we have more, we need more time to go through all of the, the different, uh, different groups and, 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 uh, and really understand the, all of the results for all these different groups. But um, it was always our, our intention to be as inclusive as possible um, whilst keeping everyone as safe as we could. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Sarah. And uh, then actually, maybe we'll insert Dr. Padma in the lineup. I thought uh, you had dropped off, but I'm glad that you're still with us. And uh, we want to give you a chance to respond as well. So Sarah and then Dr. Padma. Yes, yeah, so um, in terms of HIV, our results uh, were were very very clear that um, that uh, 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 participants with it who were HIV infected, living with HIV, um, had had on our, on the oral regimen had as good outcomes as as on as um, uh, as the as those without HIV infected. And uh, and considerably better than uh, the control. We've got less information about the other subgroups, unfortunately. But uh, yes, I, I, I'm hoping that that uh, that that um, you know that will be accrued over time. But uh, sadly, we don't have definite information on the on the other groups you mentioned. Dr. Padma, over to you. Yeah, um, uh, thank you. Uh, so in our cohort, we did have uh, adolescents and we had uh, diabetic individuals in the study and we found it was safe whether a patient had a comorbid condition of diabetes or he was non-diabetic. However, we did not have patients with uh, HIV and uh, also elderly individuals for two things. The regimen here consisted of three uh, probable QTC prolonging drugs. And as I said, uh, the, the investigators were a little hesitant to include individuals above the age of 60 years or with other comorbid conditions like hypertension. Uh, they were not comfortable enrolling them onto the trial. That's one. And uh, we did not have extra pulmonary TB because our criteria here was culture conversion and we wanted a hard uh, evidence of sputum with extra pulmonary TB, it would be difficult to get the results. So early part of the study, we did not have um, extra pulmonary TB children or pregnant women onto the trial. But your question is very, very valid. So I think now we have a little more confidence in the combination of these newer drugs. So uh, maybe as we move forward and start scaling up these uh, regimens, I think we should uh, include, make it more generalizable rather than restricting only to pulmonary TB patients. Thank you. Thank you, Padma. And uh, last but not least on this one, Colleen. So what was really, really fantastic about um, this B trial set was extremely pragmatic of almost 400 screened, 94% were enrolled. And in the drug-resistant TB trial world, that is unheard of. Um, and participants were really, really quite ill, as is evidenced by the low BMIs. Initially, we only enrolled down to age 12 because that was the bedacrine dosing that was available at the time. And when the bedacrine dosing down to six years became available, the, a protocol amendment was done to allow them to be enrolled too. The enrollment of pregnant, lady, um, pregnant women, although uh, the numbers are small, um, since it was quite opportunistic, uh, was also an effort to try and include as many people as possible and to also get the much needed PK data uh, for, these, uh, for this population. There was no upper age limit. There was no limit on severity or CD4s. And although we, um, all the patients or participants needed to have pulmonary TB, most extra pulmonary TB, such as lymph nodes or um, the miliary TB, generally weren't excluded. The only hard exclusions were CNS TB and bone TB, and that's purely because these TBs need to be treated for longer than six months or nine months or whatever they may have been randomized to. So generally, I would say that um, I'm usually in the position to be discussing about clean data and why we sometimes don't enroll everyone, but on this particular trial, it was as inclusive as I think we were going to get. Thanks.
Thanks, Pauline. I think, Wim, I'll hand it to you to start to take some questions that are coming through the chat. And to our audience out there, please um, enter your questions at this time. We still have, I think, about 10 minutes left, so plenty of time to get to questions. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, I believe that we have two questions for Dr. Francesco's presentation. Um, so we go back to Pauline. And the questions are, how many pregnant women were involved? And what is the theory for the mechanism on the nasolite-associated anemia? And how have you been helping in terms of management your study participants, particularly pregnant women, to at least reduce this side effect? Dr. Pauline, please go ahead. Thank you. So seven ladies, uh, so seven pregnant people were enrolled. Um, like I said, small numbers, uh, but thankfully, they, I think they've all delivered. Uh, so it's been really fun to have babies in the unit. Um, in terms of anemia, I think that with the with the implementation of BPAL and all of the short um, regimens that use linezolid, the rate limiting or at least the uptake limiting um, drug really is linezolid. And all of these drug and all of these shortened regimens, linezolid is really the most challenging drug and the most toxic drug. There is, I believe, a lot of fear around the use of linezolid, which is not unfounded. It is a toxic drug, but as was noted in the other presentations, the side effects of linezolid are predictable, they are manageable, and they are more common. At least something you can do about them. It's really an exercise in managing linezolid. On beat, um, it really came home to us that in Participants who at baseline are more unwell, they have normal clinical trial patients, typical clinical trial patients that start with uh, low HBs. For, um, on beat, you were allowed to be enrolled if your hemoglobin was eight or above. That already puts you in the um, in the grade uh, grade two, grade three range, depending on whether or not you're a male or female. And so, if they drop even um, a couple of decimal points, they would then be um, in below. Um, of eight. For this reason, there was quite a large uh, proportion of patients who actually required transfusion, and this was done at a higher level than would usually be done in, in normal programs. Um, there were transfusions between um, hemoglobins of six and seven, which is quite aggressive, but we also wanted to minimize the time, the duration that uh, patients were off linezolid so that we could introduce them, reintroduce them again more quickly, because we know that especially hematological side effects of linezolid tend to occur early and that is the time at which you want your linezolid to really be working because the linezolid you hit it hard you hit it early and it really does a great job in closing cavities and um, and driving the efficacy of the short regimen in terms of managing uh, we monitored the um, we monitored all the hematological side effects very closely we were aggressive with transfusing if necessary um, and a, a rather large pro pro proportion of the uh, participants did require transfusion. Um, in terms of other side effects of linezolid, peripheral neuropathy, optic neuritis, these were not as these were not as common as seen in the Nix and Xenix trials, um, also because of the lower dose of, of um, linezolid compared to Nix. So I think what's the take home message is here is that <clears throat> anemia really is the most, the earliest, the most common, and the most dangerous um, side effects of linezolid that programs really, really need to be watching out for. And transfusion services need to be upscaled in sites that want to implement um, short course regimens that use linezolid for six months. Thank you. Thank you for those important recommendations, Pauline. Um, Lindsay, back, back to you. Yeah, thanks, Wim. Um, I have a question that I wanted to ask, but before I do, I just wanted to see if any of the other panelists wanted to comment on how to manage uh, linezolid uh, side effects and toxicity. Anyone want to add anything to Pauline's comments? If you do, you can just go ahead and unmute. Okay. I'll move on to my other question then. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I think that um, the panelists have pointed out the importance of bedaclin across all of these regimens. And um, so I wanted to ask the panelists to comment on how the emergence of bedaclin resistance should be monitored for and addressed as these study findings are translated from research to policy um, and practice. So maybe I'll uh, take 
a chair liberty and call on someone to respond. I don't know, um, Catherine, if you want to go first, and then we can ask other panelists to weigh in. Yeah, I know probably just quickly to um, visit the Blenezla question you asked before. Just um, I think one of the things we've done is we've um, tested these often in, in settings that um, are, are malaria free. So I think just it's probably going to be quite a consideration in some of the resource and conflict settings with uncontrolled malaria and other causes of anemia um, when we're thinking about baseline. But yeah, no, I don't have anything to add into the conversation about transfusion other than access to safe transfusions, not um, not uh, universally available either. So um, with respect to uh, the bedaculin resistance, I, I think it is going to start to switch where our concern around um, fluoroquinolone resistance is going to start to be more concern around bedaculin resistance. And I think if we lose bedaculin in certain settings, it's going to be um, quite challenging. We may, I am already having conversations with some people who um, uh, are, are, are supporting participants, uh, people with uh, TB and um, who've had treatment failure on, on some of the some of the short regimens. And um, we were really back to talking about imipenem and, and amikacin um, and very long and difficult uh, uh, journeys for the, for the people involved, both clinicians and, and patients. We really don't want to go back to that. At the same time, we're in a situation where access to bodaquiline is still not universal, right? So um, I, I think uh, when we are talking about this, um, we need to have um, clear approaches that are um, uh, straightforward for settings to implement, either to survey or better still ensure um, good diagnostic access in parallel with implementation. Um, but uh, at, at the same time, we should make sure we are not uh, denying access to um, excellent treatments, which is uh, what we've shown this conference. Thank you, Catherine. Any of the other panelists want to add on to that response? Uh, yes, if I, if I could. Um, I mean, I think what, I mean, what we've seen in the trials, I, I think I'm right in saying, correct me if I'm wrong, um, that um, we, we, we saw uh, practically no bedaquilin resistance emerging under trial conditions, and which is very encouraging. And, and it just, um, and, and emphasizing that, you know, the huge importance of, of the, of the follow-up and trying to support adherence, um, and and I think the the fact that we have um, potentially uh, a number of alternatives now or getting there, uh, we, you know, we, we maybe don't want to put all eggs in one basket. Uh, I, I I'm I am concerned if if you have a, a small number of drugs. Uh, for, and one, and some of them are toxic, uh, and and in programmatic conditions, people may stop taking some drugs in the re, in a regimen. You you are likely to get more bedaquilin resistance, and so I, I just think it's something that in the in the rollout, people will have to be very careful about and keep an eye on, and potentially consider alternatives if the if there are concerns about. Uh, toxicity or adherence with the, with the regimens used. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, I think we are almost at time, so maybe we'll do one last question uh, in rapid fire style. So we'll go try to go as quickly as we can. So in closing, can each of the presenters please highlight one priority research gap or new question that has come out of the trials discussed today? Um, and we'll start with uh, Dr. Padma and then go to Pauline, Sarah, and then Catherine. Uh, thank you. So I, I would think doing a baseline resistance uh, like we do for fluoroquinolone to be done for the newer drugs, including bedaquilin, would uh, really help us uh, you know, go a long way of uh, avoiding acquired drug resistance. If we know somebody is resistant at baseline, maybe avoid BDQ and give some other, other new drug instead of uh, starting everybody on a bedaquilin based short-term mm -hmm. oral regimen. So doing resistance and seeing the lineages at the time would really help. 
uh, I think that would be one priority. Though it is there, not it's, it's not available in all countries, BDQ resistance at baseline. Thank you. Um, I agree with that um, countries need to upscale their detection of pedocrine resistance. It is a difficult um, it, it is a difficult drug to detect resistance on because of multiple different fitness mutations and all sorts of things. And really, because of the long tail, we are going to lose it. In South Africa, uh, patients who have rifampicin and fluoroquinolone resistance, 19% of them we are already detecting pedocrine resistance. So we're going to lose it. We need second generation um, daryl quinolines that are already in the pipeline. And we also need other oxazolidinones that are, um, are a less toxic alternative to linezolid. Unfortunately, the ones in the pipeline at the moment don't look like they are going to be available or good ones within the next five years. So we need to um, upscale detection of, of resistance, but we also need to upscale experience with, with uh, using linezolid. There's a lot of experience out there in the drug resistant TB world. We're very good at dealing with toxic drugs. I'm pretty sure we can handle linezolid. So let's make treatment shorter and easier for everyone. Thank you, Pauline. Uh, Sarah and then Catherine to take us home. Yeah, I think the only thing I'd, I'd add to all that, because I, I, I agree with it, uh, with what's been said already, is that I, I, I think that the, the focus has got to be moving forward on um, regimens that are as easy to take and non-toxic as possible, because that will allow uh, patients to complete their treatment. And we, we get resistance um, and, and difficulties when people have, you know, people stop, stop their treatments. And so I think that should be our priority, less uh, easier to take, less toxic treatments. Yeah, and finally, just on a different vein, I think there's been quite a lot of evidence generated. I'm probably sell it, talking to a, a sold audience on this, but um, you know, we've generated quite a bit of evidence in the last three to four years in particular. Um, what we're seeing is slow implementation. So I think actually we need more research on how to support um, uh, uh, people with TB and uh, in these shorter regimens that can be much shorter, sharper support. But um, I think when we're using these short treatments, the adherence is going to have to be um, at a different level. We're not going to have treatment in interruptions for two to three weeks and it be okay all the time. And, uh, and then I think also just helping the NTPs work out how to overcome the barriers and, and as well. So um, that's for me the, the priorities. And of course, a, a, new, a great pipeline is gonna help us really push forward and not, get over, and not overthink restricting um, too much regimens. Great, thanks so much. That's a great note to end on and, and a call to action of short. So I'll just close by saying thank you to my co-chair, thank you to our presenters and panelists, and thank you to everybody who tuned in for this session. And uh, we hope you enjoy uh, the rest of your conference and bye-bye. <laughs>